Part 1 of World Conquerors The Real War Criminals Chapters 1 through 4 By Hungarian Nationalist Patriot in Exile Louis Marschalko Translated into English by A. Surani Published in 1958 This audio video book is recorded, edited and produced by Joey Faust and the Phoenix Party Christian Fascists. The World Conquerors The Second World War was said to have been waged for the rights of small nations, but the author, like countless other Hungarians, is literally on the run from communism. He has been living in exile since 1945 because of his anti-communist views. Although he was never a member of any party, the communist regime of Hungary, with typical effrontery, demanded that the United States authorities to, quote, hand Louis Marschalko over as a war criminal. A former special correspondent of two leading newspapers in pre-communist Hungary, Marschalko is a brilliant novelist, playwright and poet and has many hundreds of articles in his credit. The book, World Conquerors, expresses some of the bitterness and contempt of enslaved Europeans for the rulers of the victorious nations. It shows that by being urged to throw off the German yoke, the Central European nations were tricked into becoming satellites of the Soviet. This book, World Conquerors, indicts the real war criminals. It gives horrifying glimpses of the agony behind the Iron Curtain and describes the plot to extend the slave system to the Western world. Thousands of copies of the Hungarian edition have been sold and this English translation is published to warn the West. It is written by one who is a firm friend of the English-speaking people but an implacable foe of their vacillating and corrupt governments. By the same author of the Jewish Ritual Murder Case of Tissot Esler. Red Storm. The Work of Eula Gonbosch. Besides numerous plays and poems. Printed in the United States of America. Copyright 1958. World Conquerors, The Real War Criminals. Contents. Introduction. Chapter 1. The Oldest, So-Called, Nazism, in the World. Chapter 2. The Meaning of Christ's Resistance. Chapter 3. World Domination in Three Stages. Chapter 4. Millionaire Bankers Back Bolshevism. Chapter 5. A Movement Maligned. Chapter 6. The Real War Criminals. Chapter 7. Why Hitler Had to Go. Chapter 8. The Real Victors of the Second World War. Chapter 9. Revenge is Ours. Chapter 10. New Purim and Nuremberg. Chapter 11. What Has Become of Six Million Jews. Chapter 12. Spiritual and Economic Persecution. Chapter 13. Biological Class Warfare Against All Nations. Chapter 14. The Jews Have the Atom Bomb. Chapter 15. The Betrayal of America. Chapter 16. The Fulfillment of the Protocols and the Farewell Letter of a Hungarian Martyr. Chapter 17. The Key Positions of Jewish World Power. Chapter 18. Secret Powers. Chapter 19. The Hungarian Freedom Revolt. Epilogue. Dedication to the memory of the nationalist martyrs and victims of Bolshevism. Publisher's Note In a great many cases, the translator has been able to check the quotations from books and newspapers with the originals. Where this has not been possible, the publisher asks the reader's indulgence for differences due to translation. Introduction For more than a century, under various pretexts, a battle has been waged for power over the nations. The exercise of power has become the supreme aim of many people. Bankers, politicians, clergymen, trade union leaders and communist party secretaries are all in the hunt for power. The storm troops of the dictatorships are no longer shouting the old socialist slogans. 
they declare openly and trumpet brutally power is what we want. And the so-called democratic parties, though trying to keep it a secret, have also in their hearts actually adopted the dictatorial battle cry, power is what we want. Power, like possession of the magician's wand, has become their obsession in life and it does not matter how it is achieved, whether through conservative or labor parties or through the Christian churches. The structure of modern society with its overpopulation has as a consequence developed the idolatry of power. The golden calf has been taken off its pedestal and has by now become a secondary emblem only. The gold, the wealth and all parts of the symbolic sacred animal of capitalism can be apportioned, distributed or sold by anyone who has the power to do so, as if it were meat in a butcher's shop. The church aims to attain power by controlling the human soul, the Marxist through the autocracy and omnipotence of material means, the banker by his gold or by holding in his hand the control of the press, the Bolshevist by the sheer brutality of the Tommy gun. But all parties, groups, sects, democracies, dictatorships and churches have one thing in common, they all want power. And this is quite understandable, as power often appears to be absolute, more even than all the gold in Fort Knox. For if that gold were evenly distributed among all the people on earth the share per head would be so small that it would hardly be worth anything. But power over empires, states, societies and continents is infinite. It can be distributed like the five loaves and two fishes apportioned by Christ. It secures ministerial posts, episcopal positions and benefits, senior ranks in the police force, party secretaryships as well as other major and minor offices. But only for those who are the followers of power or who belong to the organization of the bosses holding power. Included are those belonging to the herd following the party leader, trade unions, boss, dictator, or bankers, those who are members of some democratic union, Christian trade unions, or, of course, any of the Masonic lodges. So it is quite understandable that in these days nearly every slogan and school of thought is directed at one thing only, the seizure of power. Let us pray, say the churches, but behind their words, it is not always Christ's kingdom that is built, but the worldly power of some high priests engaged in double-entry bookkeeping. Freedom shout the communists to their bamboozled party members and followers, but as a background to this empty slogan loom the torture chamber, jail, detention camp and the gloomy hovels of Siberian slave laborers. Here we find side by side the misery of exploitation and the power and wealth of the privileged communist ruling classes. Democracy is the slogan proclaimed throughout the Western world, but it is well known that the voting system here does not represent the power of the people, but merely screens the mysterious influence and hidden rule exercised by secret cliques. Behind these false facades is hidden the substance of the most satanic dream of the world conquerors, to become the masters of the whole world. How can this ambitious goal, the dream and aim of Caesars, dictators, bankers and trade union potentates ever since Ezra and Moses and through Alexander the Great to Stalin, be achieved. Conventional armies have become obsolete for furthering this purpose. The hydrogen bomb might wipe out both parties. Both parties can be attacked by rockets. Such a conquest is now impracticable, so the plan is to conquer the world by peaceful means, such as by the checkbook, by UNESCO, by re-education, by a new moral code and by peace propaganda. From this idea, Lenin developed and built up his diabolic strategic system to seize and expand power, and this system under the name of Bolshevism has proved until now to be irresistible everywhere where people were unaware of the details of this power technique. The supposedly cultured world failed to realize, however, that Lenin's Bolshevism was a component only, such as were also Marxism, Freemasonry and capitalism itself. For there existed another more thorough, universal and gigantic scheme which had been working already for over a century and a half, its aim by now very nearly accomplished. 
On the basis of ancient doctrines, this latter scheme was not going to conquer global power for any of the isms, parties, sects, churches, professional organizations or social classes, but exclusively, for one nation only. The plans for Lenin's system were to some degree rough and superficial. Their greatest weakness was akin to that of a general who lets the enemy know in advance the point of attack and the strength of his forces and the tactics he intends to employ. Whereas, the other, the great fundamental plan, proved much more effective because, similarly to historically successful military operations, it has carefully guarded its secrets from outsiders and indeed often from initiated persons also. Its greatest asset was that it appeared much more general than, for example, the schemes of the trade union leaders limited to the class struggle or the tactics of church leaders restricted to the spiritual level. It was perfect and absolute totalitarianism. This planning, even today, does not attempt to capture global power by means of any particular movement or political system but through the simultaneous use of all creeds, churches, material isms, political doctrines, and patterns of power. It wishes to get built into all positions, movements, churches, Masonic lodges, and trade unions. It wants to take possession of all key positions in the most opposing movements, in the churches, parties, and trade unions. It desires to hold in its hand both Bolshevism and capitalism, materialism and idealism, to capture or hire spiritually all writers, artists, politicians, and the mob. It aims at not being visible anywhere but at being present everywhere and at directing and controlling everything to divide and rule, to march detached but at a given moment to assault united. Anybody now surveying the world and world affairs may well realize that this plan has already taken shape. The atomic fission of human society has achieved perfect success. Mankind is divided not only by the natural God-created races and nations. Even the nations are split up now. East and West Germany are divided, as are also North and South Korea. China, Indochina and Trieste are split up or separated while Europe is divided by the Iron Curtain. Populations are split up and divided into white and colored persons, capitalists and Bolsheviks, employers and employees, moneyed classes and working classes, Catholics and Protestants, suppressors and suppressed, victors and vanquished. But, as we will see later, all this chaos, disorder and division is directed by the same iron will, by the same secret force acting according to the interest of the leaders of a single race of 15 million people. They are to be found behind the well-padded doors of world capitalism as well as behind the thick walls of the Kremlin. It is they who instigate enraged crowds to strike and demonstrate while at the same time giving wage rises and promoting inflation. They attack Christianity while acting simultaneously as trustees of the gold and other assets representing the earthly power of the churches whose kingdom is not of this world. They are the Adam scientists and the anti-Adam humanists, they are the masters and the murderers of the communist secret police, yet at the same time, they condemn the murders of the nations in UNO, or United Nations Organization. They are the archenemy of patriotic ideals, they preach against the sovereignty of states and against racial discrimination, while all the time representing a racial nationalism of a vehemence so far unknown to have ever reigned over the nations of the earth. Our globe with all its continents, either openly or secretly, is already dominated by this Jewish nationalism. By using certain methods this fact can be demonstrated just as the presence of atomic radiation can be demonstrated by the aid of a Geiger counter. For instance, should any nation, state, press or politician, parliament or any other person commit any act not forbidden by law or by the moral code against another state, class or person, then in this sublime age of democracy everything is free and permit without risk. But should anyone commit the same act against Jewry or even against one Jew, the Jews will wipe off from the face of the earth this offending entity, 
whether it be an individual or a great nation. This will be affected, if necessary, by the atomic bomb or by the victorious Red Army or by the aid of any of the democratic constitutions, perhaps by the use of terror prisons or the checkbook or Tommy gun. Amongst many other things, this invisible seizure of power owed its success to misapprehension and oversight on the part of anti-Jewish people during the last century. They regarded the Jew as an internationalist, which is not the real reason for opposing him. On the other hand, one could not justify his behavior in destroying his fellow men any the easier because his motives were based on race, creed, or birth, which, in fact, is what does motivate them. So we are convinced that it is our God-granted right and human duty to fight against the reign of terror exercised on a supranational level by a small fanatical nationalist minority, which has subjugated the world and driven humankind far along the road to total extinction. By the flash of the atomic bomb, we should see at last that we are living in a false, dishonest, deceitful world order, in a disorganized society on the eve of a universal catastrophe. This satanic tribal nationalism holds world power in its grasp. It holds the hydrogen bomb and, in its mad blindness, could destroy the whole of the globe and, with it, humanity. Is all this a bad dream or a nightmare? To answer this question, we must learn more about this tribal nationalism and its tactics. Then we shall see that the nightmare will resolve itself into reality and fact. Chapter 1 the oldest, Nazism, in the world. And ye shall possess greater nations, mightier than yourselves. Deuteronomy. 11, 23. Without a detailed study of the Old Testament, i.e. Torah, we can neither find the solution to those Jewish aspirations bent on capturing world power nor understand the events of the present day. Those who are not intimate with the first five books of the Old Testament, i.e. the Pentateuch, might readily conceive doubts that any such Jewish intentions exist at all, and they will usually dismiss any references thereto as anti-Semitic delusions. Such people are unable to realize that Jewry is standing on the threshold of total world domination. Since the end of the Second World War and the defeat of German National Socialism they will label anybody a Nazi who dares to refer to these appalling facts, he will be accused of preparing a new dictatorship and, perhaps, planning another massacre. By making the word Jew taboo they are suppressing the freedom to express one's opinion and thoughts and at the same time making sure that people all over the world will not be able to see clearly in the moment of danger. The accusation of Nazism is handy, cheap and popular. The so-called man in the street knows as much about National Socialism as the big Jewish press organs find fit for him to know and, therefore, in his ignorance he considers Jewry a persecuted race and to him the mere utterance of the word Jew represents anti-Semitism. So having his mind poisoned by propaganda, the man in the street, is disinclined to realize that everything which he now curses and condemns in German National Socialism, those principles for which its leaders were hanged in Nuremberg in the name of world conscience, have existed for the last three to four thousand years. During the Führership of Moses, everything was the same in the totalitarian regime of Yahweh. The Jewish race protection laws of those days and Jewish tribal nationalism have survived to outlive the leader of German National Socialism himself. For the conception of racial superiority, together with its religious and political cults, are not Hitlerian inventions. When Hitler, Goebbels and Rosenberg availed themselves of a racial conception, they were doing nothing else but using against Jewry the weapons of Jewry. Everything that world Jewry, under the disguise of the flag of the Allied powers, condemned, was actually of its own make and device. Jewry actually hanged itself at Nuremberg. For the laws relating to and establishing racial segregation were first published in the books of the prophets Ezra and Nehemiah, and not in the Rassenschutz Gesetz, Race Protection Act, of Nuremberg. The first concentration camps were devised not by Heinrich Himmler but by King Solomon. 
the motto of total annihilation and total extermination of the defeated enemy first appeared in the orders of Moses, the Jewish Führer. Hitler only proclaimed that the Germans are a superior race to the Jews. On this point, Moses went too far greater extremes in announcing that Jewry is of direct divine origin and the chosen people of God and, consequently, sacred. Each and every Jew is personally sacred and he who offends a Jew, offends God himself. This is tacitly held even today in the opinion of Jewry. What else is this if not the most exaggerated chauvinistic form of racial totalitarianism? It is quite clear that this haughty and ancient consciousness of racial excellence and sanctity remain very much alive up to the present day, when we see Jewry protesting against the trial of an indicted Jew before any Gentile court, for when they regard and treat an affront against one Jew as an affront against the whole of Jewry. According to the 4,000-year-old standards of Jewish nationalism, any insult against a Jew is a direct insult against God and a crime against the sacred seed of Abraham. The first and most important commandment of Moses, the great state administrator, is designed to safeguard racial purity. The ever-recurring motif of the Old Testament is this order of Moses, who, before the conquest of the Promised Land, points at the neighboring peoples and then says to the children of Israel, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt take unto thy son. Deuteronomy 7, 2-3 for thousand years later, German National Socialism had the same object in view when marriage, friendship and commercial activities with Jews were forbidden by the Nuremberg Laws. The judges put forward by the Jews in the Nuremberg show trials could not emphasize enough in the name of world conscience that the German racial laws were barbaric. But at the same time, these judges were unaware that by their sentence it was the Jews themselves they were condemning. For when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Nehemiah 13. 3. And the diary of the Nazi prophet continues. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people, and I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Nehemiah 13. 23-25. Nehemiah, the prophet of the race protection laws of those ancient times, nevertheless only curses and beats up those corrupting racial purity whilst Ezra acts with much more vigor and energy. He tells us in his book that the Jews have taken wives among the daughters of the Canaanites, Hittites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians and Amorites, according to the abominations of these people, and that therefore the holy seed was mingled with the people of those lands. Ezra 9, 1, 2, 12. Ezra orders the polluters of Jewish racial purity to come to Jerusalem and he exposes and denounces them in his book and quoting the divine law, demands that they shall dismiss their non-Jewish wives, and there were among them wives who had borne sons already, relates the Old Testament. It does not matter. All have to perish who desecrated the holy seed, mothers as well as half-caste children. In the theocratic state, the racial god Führership will not tolerate mothers of foreign origin or crossbred children. The prophets cannot foresee that 2,000 years later in Mr. Solzberger's New York Times the same lack of toleration will be stamped and condemned as deadly sin against God when the laws of Ezra and Nehemiah are applied against the Jews themselves. 
The Christian Church is teaching and preaching the Old Testament brand the Hitlerian laws of Nuremberg as ungodly and yet show full and pious understanding towards the ruling of the new Israeli parliament when, in 1953, it banned marriage between Jew and Gentile. Such racial discrimination might appear to be a dark superstition, a heresy. Nevertheless, the Jewish laws regard racial purity as a commandment of the utmost importance. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Deuteronomy 23. 3. The later descendants of the Jews took this commandment of Moses so seriously that, according to Houston Stewart Chamberlain, Jewish girls who had evidently become pregnant by Gentile men were sent away to other communities, where the expectant mothers, together with their children, were killed. American Jewish rabbis as recently as 1949 issued decrees banning intermarriage between Jews and Gentiles. The magic of the sanctity of the Holy Seed, the consciousness of being the master race, burns in the Old Testament with the fierce glow of the most fanatical nationalism of all times. The Jews killed and destroyed the non-Jewish peoples of ancient times in obedience to the religious and national laws of the god Führership. and when we think of the Nuremberg trials of the modern war criminals it makes us realize how much more the Jewish kings and prophets of old deserved condemnation on the very same score. But the so-called Christian churches condemn nothing, yet continue teaching Gentile children that most pornographic and bloodthirsty book, the Old Testament. The so-called Jewish holy books on the other hand clearly boast of revenge, relating most macabre accounts of the slaying and extermination of entire nations. They proclaim the slaughter of the innocents, including even babies if they are non-Jewish, as the fulfillment of the highest national duty and as a deed most pleasing to God. Thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Deuteronomy. 7, 2. The Judean master race is at liberty to commit crime. According to Torah and the prophets the slaying and destruction of other races and peoples is not only a religious duty but an absolute right of the Jewish nation and this right includes the prerogative of ruling over others. The prophet Isaiah already depicts this coming world power in resplendent and brilliant colors, as follows. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers, they shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. Isaiah 49, 22, 23 and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breasts of kings. Isaiah 60, 10-12, 16. Not only on the ground of racial prejudice, but on the basis of direct divine commandment, the Jews feel themselves entitled to subjugate strangers and to treat as slaves all those who fall into their power. And Solomon numbered all the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set three score and ten thousand of them to be bearers of burdens and four score thousand to be hewers in the mountain. 2 Chronicles 2. 17 18. After Moses' race protection, Nuremberg laws, after the racial segregation and world power mania of Ezra and Nehemiah, we now see the first concentration camp and slave labor establishment in which foreigners work for the master race. They are related as an accomplished fact without ever being condemned by a humanitarian court. The schemes of the Soviet terror chambers and the forced labor camps of the Kaganovich Empire were conceived in the land of Israel. 
It is the Old Testament and not Main Camp that must be studied in order to see that the gas chamber made world famous by the Salzburger Press was actually the invention of the chosen people. The prophet Samuel tells us how the humanitarian race in the ecstatic rapture of victory dealt with its defeated enemies, and he brought forth the people that were therein, in the Ammonite city of Rabbah, translator, and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron, and made them pass through the brick kiln, and thus did he unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 12, 31. The first concentration camp, the first gas chamber, a brick kiln, in the world were in the land of Israel. And the first ghetto was established in Jerusalem and not in Europe. The Jew shaped his own fate, wrote Houston Stuart Chamberlain referring to these things. This Jewish tribal nationalism, which created the race-protecting laws, the ghettos, the concentration camps and the gas chambers of ancient times, never died out. It continued slaying and killing neighboring peoples and races. Whenever it was defeated, it arose again. It chanted the melancholic sounds of its irredentism by the waters of Babylon during the captivity and after the liberation, it began to build the new Jerusalem with the vehemence of a revived nationalism. It had suffered but was awaiting the new Messiah, the Jewish nationalist deliverer and political leader, the new Fuhrer, who would place world power over all the nations in the hands of Jewry. Jewry has never abandoned this grandiose national dream. During the Zionist Congress of 1897 at Baal, Dr. Mandelstein, professor of the University of Kiev, in the course of his speech opening the conference on August 29, emphatically stated that the Jews will use all their influence and power to prevent the rise and prosperity of all other nations and are resolved to adhere to their historic hopes, i.e. to the conquest of world power. Lutemps, September 3, 1897 by such fanatical nationalism, the first ghetto was established in Jerusalem and the complete separation from non-Jews accomplished. Joel, Chapter 3. 17. It was promised that Jehovah, the celestial Führer, would dwell in Jerusalem forever and that all non-Jewish people would be excluded from God's presence. It is taught by the Jewish rabbis that all non-Jewish people must be excluded from sharing the new world or taking any part in it, they can only be tolerated as a despised herd. Tractate, Gittin, Folio. 57, Babylonian Talmud. Jewish tribal nationalism faced the most perilous times in its history following the birth of Christ. This was, or could have been, a fatal moment in the history of Jewry. It was also a bitter disappointment. The Jews were shocked to learn that he was not the Messiah they were awaiting. He was no nationalist liberator to rid them of the Roman soldiers. He was anti-nationalist, or, as he would be called today, an international rebel, one who, in the temple, dared to kick over the merchants' wares, to overthrow the desks of the money changers and to evict the representatives and agents of the local money authorities. It was just as if a determined McCarthyist were to raid the New York Stock Exchange with a whip in his hand. This new prophet did not believe in the racial superiority of Jewry, but in the brotherhood of all mankind. According to the standards of Jewry his racial origin is highly doubtful and open to suspicion, because he came from Galilee, and in Jerusalem, everybody could recognize his disciples by their Galilean dialect. In the streets of Jerusalem this master and his disciples preached against the doctrines expounded by the most powerful authorities on the Jewish chauvinistic way of life and on Jewish nationalism, i.e. they preached against the Sanhedrin and against the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. This master and his disciples did not believe in a separate tribal alliance between God and the Jews. In contradiction to the tenets of the chief rabbis, Peter, the fisherman from Galilee, tells Cornelius the captain and centurion of the Roman Empire that all nations are pleasing to God, which fear him and act righteously. These disciples teach in the name of the Lord Jesus that Romans, 
Jews and Greeks are all human beings and that there is no exclusive deliverance reserved for any single nation, that there is no special messiah for Jews only, that there is no racial superiority for the followers of Jehovah, as all are human beings, children of the one and only God. He told them that he was the deliverer not only of the Jews but of all mankind and that he was not prepared to accept the supremacy and rule of any master race. Therefore, he had to be crucified. Crucify him, they shouted to the Roman governor, who, an opportunist state official similar to the eternally shameful figure of the public prosecutor of Nuremberg, faced the mob's concentrated hatred in confusion of spirit. Crucify him, after all, this Messiah might well prove not to be the descendant of the holy seed of Abraham. Houston Stewart Chamberlain in his book entitled, Die Grundlegen den Nunzenten Jahrhunderts, or, The Foundations of the Nineteenth Century, deduces clearly the fatal consequences attending Jewry's entry into world history and is the earliest author to discover that Christ, insofar as racial descent is concerned, was not a Jew. Chamberlain was the first author who came to the conclusion that the name of Galilee itself is actually Jelol Hagoyim, meaning heathen or Gentile land where non-Jewish settlers lived. They were easily distinguished by their dialect. The possibility that Christ was not a Jew and that there was not a drop of Jewish blood in his veins is so great that it nearly equals to certainty, he writes in the book quoted above, Volume 1, page 256. The question, was Christ a Jew, is posed by Ferenc Zajthi, the Hungarian historian, in his monumental book Hungarian Millennia, in which he proves that the Jews themselves doubted Christ's Jewish descent. Zajthi points out that in the 7th century B. C. Shalmaneser drove the whole population of Galilee into captivity in chains and that not a single Jew was left there. The Scythian pastoral tribes who subsequently settled into the home of the displaced population adopted the Jewish creed with its religious teachings, but, as the Jews themselves termed it, they were, under Jewish laws only. The Jews never accepted them as true descendants of Abraham's holy seed. Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, John 7. 52, the Jews told the apostles. Prophets can arise from Jewish racial communities only. The ancient Jewish laws protected Jewish individuals to the utmost, and the death sentence could only be pronounced on an esti, i.e. on a person who tried to persuade Jews to abandon their creed or who attempted to cause a rift in their racial unity. Ferenc Zajthi describes how, according to the ancient Jewish laws and customs, the way of escape was all the time kept open for even such a person when under the death sentence. On the way leading to the place of execution, observers were posted at every hundred steps. The observer's duty was to report if any new witnesses gave a sign by raising their arm that they were willing to come forward and testify in order to save the life of the condemned. In the case of any new witnesses coming forward, the laws ordered new trials to be held or an amnesty to be granted. It is peculiar, though under the circumstances quite natural, that in the procession following Jesus to the cross, no witness volunteered to testify and save him. Among those who received him on Maundy Thursday with jubilant festivities, not one raised his hand nor did any of those who heard his teachings and saw his miracles. No witness volunteered to save him. And here we have the decisive proof that he was not a Jew in that nobody was permitted to come forward. Because, according to the laws of the Jewish state, retrial was permissible for the descendants of Abraham's holy seed only. From this right the Goyim, the Gentiles, the strangers, the descendants of those of all non-Jewish blood were excluded, as well as those who came under the jurisdiction of the Jewish laws but were not Jews racially. So excluded were the hated Galileans, the Cushans, and the Huvelans that, according to the Jewish laws, they were to be pressed under the water and drowned by any wayfarer, happening to pass who should see them struggling in the water. We Christians accept the theory of the Immaculate Conception, 
i.e., the tenet that Christ was, in fact, the Son of God and thus he has no raciality. But in this case, it is even more certain that Christ's divine origin, whole personality, and teachings represented a power revolution against the tribal chauvinism of the Jews. The Christian Middle Ages, labeled the Dark Ages, by the propaganda of Jewish intellectuals, were very much aware of the importance of Christ's resistance against Jewish tribal nationalism. We will have the opportunity later to show how this Christian clear-sightedness became more confused after the French Revolution and the Jewish Emancipation. From that time until the present day, the artificial befogging and obscuration of all Christian ideals has been in progress, and by now the darkness is so impenetrable that many movements and lines of thought confuse Christianity and Judaism. Even worse than this, some Christian priests in their ceremonial are adopting that fanatical hatred which is a characteristic feature of Jewish rabbis, e.g. the prayer of the American Protestant Padres read out before the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The nationalism convicted at Nuremberg lived only 20 years. But Moses' main camp with its dogma of racial nationalism was preserved and diligently studied by Jewry throughout many thousands of years. The intensity of this ancient nationalism has never abetted, not even during the times of Galuth, i.e. homelessness. After the Babylonian captivity, Jews and members of diaspora from the Roman Empire settled around Alexandria. They were all free Roman citizens and liberal-minded people and still continued sending considerable annual gifts to the Temple of Jerusalem. After the dispersion, diaspora, the flame of this nationalism became more intense and vehement. 700 years ago, Mos Ban Majman, one of the most brilliant writers of Jewish script, gives us yet another description in Mishnah Torah, in resplendent colors, of the possibilities of the Messiah's arrival and of the attainment of world power by his nation. The world became familiar with those things pertaining to the Messiah and to Torah, he wrote, continuing, these things became known in faraway lands and amongst many uncircumcised peoples. The Christians were conversant with many things though formerly the Messiah was known by Israel alone. Maimonides also admits that Christianity made the world familiar with the Old Testament, i.e. with Torah, but adds that its interpretation was erroneous and that the errors will be evident at the arrival of Jewry's political messiah who, as leader of Jewry's armed power, will subjugate the non-Jewish nations of the world and will exterminate, together with their women and children, all those who refuse to accept the laws of Noah. Jewry and Christianity by Canon Lippet Huber, page 141. During Galuth, Jewish nationalism became transformed into a religious irredentism, with Torah and Talmud acting as its MEM camp. The Mosaic main camp is preserved everywhere and kept in the Torah shrine of even the smallest village. This national creed was copied again and again by scribes on papyri, their eyes tired and inflamed by the work, through the letters of which the language of the lost land was learned by children and practiced by adults. The temple was destroyed but the national way of life never ceased to exist. That religious nationalism which, together with Torah in days of old pervaded the land, spread to every place on earth where Jews were living. And this nationalist teaching prescribed not only the rules of life, the form of prayers, the quality of clothing, methods of general hygiene, and dietary regulations, but also shaped and developed the nationalist ideology. Torah remained the same in Bells, Frankfurt or New York as anywhere else. Jewry, dispersed, took refuge from the world in their own reserved ghetto, fortifying their spirit by the study of Torah and Talmud. One of the greatest mistakes of the anti-Semites was to regard the Jew as an internationalist. The Jew was never an internationalist, but the conscious representative of a tribal nationalism that sought domination over all the other nations on earth. He lived in various lands, occupied positions of different social levels, but fundamentally remained a Jew. 
during the preparatory sittings of the Sanhedrin summoned by Napoleon in 1806, Rabbi Solomon Lippmann Surfbear said, We have forgotten whose descendants we are. We are neither German nor Portuguese Jews. However dispersed all over the globe we may be, we still remain the same nation. Dr. Leopold Kahn summed up these sentiments when speaking about Zionism in a Jewish school at Potsdam, Bratislava, in 1901, Jews will never be assimilated and will never adopt the customs or morals of strangers. The Jew will remain a Jew under all circumstances. This venerable rabbi was right. Jews lived in different countries, occupying different social levels, but remained everywhere Jews. If a Jew took off his kaftan and enjoyed forbidden foods, dressed in tails or a dinner jacket, he yet remained a representative of the same creed, the same blood relationship and the same nationalism. Perhaps he might not be living literally up to the words of his religious rites, but his racial consciousness and awareness of racial obligations remained unchanged, whether on the papal throne, in the Soviet Politburo or in the State Department at Washington. The Jewish author David Makata writes in his book The Jews in Spain and in Portugal that for generations Jews lived in Spain disguised, intermingling with all the social classes but occupying all the key positions of the state, especially those in the church. Jews can always argue that there is such a thing as assimilation. They point at Jews who assumed the language and customs of their adopted countries, married Christian women and became statesmen of Christian empires. But they cannot refute the fact that the Jew who apparently becomes a true Englishman or true German or a most excellent Polish patriot still remains consciously a Jew, and the state of the world today bears evidence of this fact, consequently, his allegiance lasts only so long as it does not clash with his Jewish origin. Another extremely efficient weapon of the Jew is his ability, like the chameleon, to assume the colors of his habitat. In France, he merges into the background of the local environment, as he does in Hungary, in England and everywhere else. But although he tries to appear an Englishman in England and a Yankee in America, this is a disguise only and calculated for defense as well as for conquest. In New York and Brooklyn, where outside of Russia itself the largest crowds of Russian Jews and Polish Jews live, one rarely sees a Jew wearing a kaftan or a beard. Relatives waste no time giving a good shave to the new immigrant, they know only too well that beards and earlocks provoke anti-Semitism. They sense that any open appearance of Jewish nationalism would arouse opposition among their hosts. The protocols of the elders of Zion warn them of this. Secrecy is the foundation of our power. Therefore, in Soviet Russia, the Jew is either a Bolshevik revolutionary in strict adherence to the party line, or an officer of the secret police with a submachine gun, in America a Yankee-like banker, and in France a radical patriot. Of course, he must also be a party member in Soviet Russia and probably a democratic elector in New York. But, whatever political convictions they profess, whatever nationality they may have assumed, they always remain Jews at heart, following the craving of their Jewish nationalism. Sometimes, appropriately enough, it happens that the Jewish aims coincide with the aspirations of their adopted countries. But, in fact, they never accept the authority of any stranger, obeying the Mosaic law, thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, Deuteronomy. 17, 15, i.e. who is not a member of the Jewish race. With the development of civilization, this adaptation to environment became more complete. This was best seen in the professions, such as the stage, the films, and journalism. The film industry in Hollywood was once regarded as the national industry of America. Those who directed this industry occasionally made good American films. But under cover of the Stars and Stripes, they attempted to inculcate a Jewish mentality and a spirit of false values into the American masses, and as we will see later, it was from this Hollywood camouflage that the hundred anti-American Bolshevik film stars emerged. 
the Bolshevik Jew in his attempt to conquer world power threw away his mask. It was consistent with the nature of a 4,000-year-old nationalism that Jews should endure persecution, mockery, and contempt. But the more they suffered, the stronger their belief grew that the time would come when they would be the masters of all peoples. Thus, Jewry tolerated even anti-Judaism. Often they themselves failed to understand why they were persecuted, derided and sometimes even murdered. For the Jew felt that he was God's creature the same as any other human being, even though anti-Semites might doubt it. So he was often insulted and humiliated and labeled a swindler and ridiculed and cartooned. Most people, apparently, remained unaware that his objectionable activities served a higher nationalism, that typical Old Testament sort of nationalism which is irreconcilable towards all other peoples and which aims at the subjugation of all nations. The relationship between the nationalism of the Old Testament and German National Socialism may be compared to that of earth and sky. German National Socialism was ready and willing to cooperate with other peoples. It was hostile to one race only, Jewry. Whereas the Jewish type of Nazism is hostile to all races and to all non-Jewish social and ruling castes. Generations in the ghetto taught the Jews that those racial laws, which kept them together as a nation, could also enable them to become the masters of all nations. To this, apart from modern developments, there was added another favorable racial feature, their indisputable talents and high intelligence. Jewish writers, artists, businessmen and bankers, regardless of the methods adopted, were reaping the highest awards of Western civilization. For the small Jews, left behind in this race, all the successes were Jewish successes, all the achievements were Jewish achievements. Not only the press but the most simple Jew revered Disraeli, the great English statesman, together with Heine, the great German poet and Marx, the most capricious international revolutionary. What is this if not the conscious splendor of an unrivaled nationalism or extreme Nazism? A nationalism that brooks successful apostasy and is unwilling to execute even a criminal if it knows that he also is a descendant of the seed of Abraham, a nationalism that encourages the successful apostate to return to the fold, which he had rejected. And so we nearly always find Jews making headway all over the world, either as poets, bankers, English conservatives, or Portuguese revolutionaries, all believing they are predestined to reign over the peoples of the earth. So far, they have succeeded in everything. It is clear, therefore, that the tenets laid down in Torah, the Talmudical principles and the Jewish secret institutions created during the Middle Ages are still effective instruments serving towards the achievement of world power. It is our vocation to rule the world, proclaims this aggressive minority. Either as American banker or as Soviet commissar we form but one nation. It is the chief purpose of this book to show that capitalism and Bolshevism, the two great ruling systems of our modern age, are not two opposing movements but that they rather present two different forms of expression of the same Jewish ambition to obtain world power. One of them, possibly, is more cautious than the other, nevertheless, both are the same. The attempt to bring about a conflict between capitalism and Bolshevism is therefore a most terrible deception. The enmity directed towards Christians and Arabs proceeds from both these systems. The man in the street as the symbol of the uneducated and uninformed masses may think that the capitalist world will be able to fix Bolshevism all right but the true fact is that the latter is nothing else but an extension of the former. Bolshevism is the offspring of capitalism or, perhaps, it is the result of the blunders of capitalism. Bolshevism is the adopted child of the Jewish liberal capitalist system. Those who try to find some difference or contradiction between the two systems must never forget that in Hitlerian National Socialism, the big German capitalist entertained the most friendly relations with German socialist workers. 
Why therefore, could not the Jewish Bernard Baruch have been on the best possible terms with Lazar Kaganovich or even with the small communist leader of Brooklyn? We are one nation, stated Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism. We are neither American Jews nor Soviet Jews, but only Jews. By the turn of the last century, having regard to the results achieved, it appeared as if the unity of the Holy Seed and its calling to win world power had begun to crystallize into reality. This was visualized in the imagination of the Jewish authors, poets, bankers, socialist revolutionaries and communist apostles. A world-conquering nationalism had arrived. The anti-Semites themselves failed to notice and evaluate this development, and the events of 1945 had to transpire before a realization came concerning the indisputable mental and racial unity of capitalist democracy on the one hand and of Soviet people's democracy on the other. It is hardly necessary to remark that this realization was attained by an exceedingly small minority. The anti-Semites saw and understood the Jewish racial solidarity, the dishonest business methods and the Judaization of their own countries only. Meanwhile, what was considered by some to be a Jewish crime was a virtue in the estimation of Jewish nationalism. The racial consciousness of the master race, i.e. mosaic nationalism, attained its present form by the end of the 19th century. Its slogan forged for Bolsheviks and bankers alike was, let us march independently and be victorious together. So the world conquerors began their march and set out to subjugate the globe and to become rulers of all nations. Chapter 2 The Meaning of Christ's Resistance In the Middle Ages men still recognized the cleavage between the spirit of the New Testament and the Jewish Nazism of the Old Testament against which Christ rebelled. In Christ's person, the ideal of human brotherhood was fully accomplished. The Old Testament contained the materialistic covenant of a single race with its Jehovah. Christ brought deliverance to the whole of mankind. He made the covenant in the New Testament for all of us. The idea of universal love and the whole inner meaning of the New Testament was the antithesis of materialistic Judaism with its obsession of predetermined power. The greatest lie of history is the statement alleging that Christianity was born out of the Jewish religion. On the contrary, Christianity came into being as the very negation of Jewish nationalism and racial predestination. The apostles themselves taught this. Ye know, Peter said, how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts 10. 28. The Jews were amazed to be told that the Goyim also may enjoy and share the divine grace of the Holy Ghost. They complained that the apostles sat down at the same table with uncircumcised people. They staged a demonstration in Athens against Paul the Apostle because he brought Greeks into the synagogue and defiled the holy place. Peter's statement, already quoted, uttered during his visit to Cornelius the Centurion, together with the quotation below, sound like a defiance of the prevailing Jewish tribal arrogance. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness, is accepted with him. Acts 10. 34-35. But the teaching of Paul and Barnabas in Antioch sounds even more defiant. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo we turn to the Gentiles. Acts 13. 46. By Gentiles they meant the Goyim, i.e., the non-Jewish peoples. And, God, hath made of one blood all nations of men. Acts 17, 26, says Paul in Athens. And he says this because from the God-created blood brotherhood, one nation, one race, the Jews, excluded themselves by their own fierce tribal nationalism. 
and art confident Paul writes, concerning the Jews, that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the babes, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Paul, to the Romans, 2, 19-20, 23-24. The apostles everywhere teach and preach Christ's revolutionary ideas, which are the very negation of Judaism, of that tribal reservedness and of that Jewish Nazism. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Acts 28. 27-28. But the Jews crucified the apostle of this faith and have not to the present day abandoned their belief that they are the chosen people and therefore the lords and masters of all peoples on earth. The dispersion of Jewry began with Diaspora, after the Babylonian captivity and was completed by the demolition of Jerusalem. As a result of this, the long pent-up demoniacal force was spread abroad, the ambitious aim to rule over all nations accompanied by an exclusive racialism penetrated the ethnic and religious confusion of those ancient times. It is not necessary to discuss here in detail how it was, though Jewry was not purebred as a race being composed of crossbreeds of various peoples and remnants of different races, that nevertheless this racial conglomerate was shaped and molded by Ezra and Nehemiah into the only homogeneous pure race in the world. Even at the end of the 19th century various American anthropological investigations came to the conclusion that the Jewish race retained its ethnical purity throughout. Political Anthropological Review. March, 1904, page 1003. Houston Stewart Chamberlain writes that from Theodosius until the year 1800 there were only 300 persons of non-Jewish stock actually adopted by Jewry in the racial sense. From this extreme racialism proceeded a mentality which hated and despised all other peoples whilst being at the same time ambitious to conquer. In Europe appeared the materialistic and uncompromising spirit of the Old Testament, which never abandoned its messianic dream of that time to come when the destruction of all peoples and the mastery over greater and mightier nations would be accomplished. It is therefore easy to understand that the ancient world, as well as the Middle Ages, drew the obvious inference from this, and separated themselves from the Jews not only ideologically but physically also. Over the people of those days, the biblical account of the descent of the Holy Ghost and of Peter's sermon on that first Whitsun morning still exerted a considerable influence. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Acts 2. 40. The Middle Ages created the ghetto but at the same time, by this act, preserved the Jewish race. Generally speaking, Jewry was able to sustain its policy of racial purity because this was recognized by the Christian world in the form of the ghetto. But, unfortunately, this did not prevent the Jews from infiltrating into the life and economic systems of the Christian states. We can learn the history of this Jewish influence from the ancient world. Nearly a million Jews were settled in Alexandria and its suburbs after the Babylonian captivity, where they played the same role and exercised much the same power as Jewry does in New York today. In the Roman Empire, especially in Rome, the power and influence of this nationalist tribal minority reached quite formidable dimensions. Cicero, the great Roman statesman, during the proceedings of a court action, made his address to the court in such a subdued voice that he could only be heard by the judges. He explained the wisdom of acting in such a fashion by stating that Jewish solidarity constituted a force formidable enough to ruin anybody giving evidence against them. Throughout diaspora and from early times, the Jews possessed organizations akin to those we now know as Masonic. 
they initiated certain influential Gentiles who were prepared to declare themselves to be half-Jewish and through whom they were able to establish their influence in the highest places in public life. It can be established that behind Nero's persecution of the Christians were members of diaspora. Papia Sabina, the wife of the emperor, was a Jewess and a member of diaspora and she succeeded in persuading the emperor through the help of his favorite courtier, a Jewish actor named Illiterus, to exterminate the Christians. Throughout historical times, the Alatyruses and Papias of this world have been behind its Neros and Roosevelts. Jewish influence played as much part in determining the downfall of the Roman Empire as in causing the ruin of the Spanish Empire. In the Spanish Empire Jews had, as Heman writes, the control of all spiritual and material powers from the tenure of land to the highest ecclesiastical positions, and through their usury they exercised much influence over court circles and the entire nobility. In the end, they were able to extort for themselves such fantastic privileges that in a court of law the oath of one Jew was accepted as of greater value than the oaths of two Gentiles. They repeated the same form of power grab later in Germany and in the Habsburg Empire. In the 16th century, a Jew called Imre Fortunatus and his associates played a tremendous part in the preparation for the downfall of the Hungarian Empire by fostering corruption in public affairs to such a degree that the empire became unable to resist the attacks of the expanding Turkish power at the Battle of Mohacs in 1526. The spiritual leaders and statesmen of the ancient world and Middle Ages were very much aware of this Jewish influence. From Tiberius, the Roman emperor, to Goethe, all men of vision looked upon Jewry as a national danger. A ministry from which the Jew obtains all his requirements, a household, the wardrobe and finances of which are under the control of a Jew or a commissariat which is under the management of a Jew must indeed be endowed with the undrainable qualities of the Pontine Marshes, writes Goethe. Possibly the great Napoleon was the most clear-sighted of all when he exclaimed, These Jews are like locusts and caterpillars, and they will devour my France. It was clearly seen even as late as the 18th century that Jewish influence had nothing of the much-vaunted humanitarianism about it, since it was a minority movement which became a state within a state. Though some states did not recognize the danger, nevertheless, the Jewish conquest was usually stopped at the last moment. Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic, expelled them from Spain and elsewhere restrictive measures were taken to check them, but the most important thing was that the influence of Jewish Nazism was nowhere permitted to gain a foothold in public affairs. The ghetto at least served as a good institution in keeping up ideological and intellectual barriers against the Jews so that the Christian religions and cultures were not so exposed to mortal danger and to that of being visibly engulfed, as they are today. It is important to note that up to the French Revolution the Jews had no direct influence on the masses. At the most they were only able to increase their influence over some court circles by the help of their money bags, but they never had an opportunity of establishing any direct control over the people or of exploiting them by furthering the interests of their own nationalism. One point only of the so-called Jewish problem passed unnoticed in the Middle Ages. Namely, that the growing influence of Jewish nationalism and its encroachment was not an instinctive activity originating from greed, selfishness, or any other Jewish characteristic as the anti-Semites termed it. The demoniacal urge was already consciously at work, and the nationalism of the Old Testament, of Torah and of Talmud were impelling the Jew to undertake a quest not for money, nor for riotous living and wealth, but for world power. Money merely served as the means towards this aspiration, while the attainment of mastery over the whole world remained the supreme aim. For this, not even a Jewish central government was required though such existed from time to time. Talmud and Torah were quite sufficient. These books, which gave much better instruction than any government as to the conduct of Jewry, were to be found in all synagogues and in all Jewish houses. 
the various countries and empires were more or less able to keep this world-conquering dream under control while its execution in different lands was uncoordinated. The danger grew very considerably with the expansion of the limits of the known world and when, through the medium of the press, radio, and other organs of propaganda, the different countries and peoples drew nearer to each other. Then the aspiration of this Jewish minority nationalism to dominate was to operate effectively not only against single countries but against all lands and peoples simultaneously and with full force. At the same time, with the rise of Protestantism, a certain Jewish mentality began to obtain a foothold within Christianity itself. Luther saw clearly that the difference between universal humanity and Jewish tribal Nazism was irreconcilable. His great treatise written on the Jewish question is the proof of his clear-sightedness. But, apart from the rise of Protestantism, the Old Testament obtained a greater influence through the teaching of the Bible in church sermons and through religious education in the schools. The Protestant preachers, Hungarians, Swiss, Englishmen, Dutchmen and Germans alike turned more and more to the prophets of the Old Testament for parables and quotations. During the religious wars, all the most withering curses of the Old Testament were invoked on the heads of opponents. The mentality of the Old Testament thus penetrated the Christian faith through the empty phraseology of rhetoric. Christianity began to regard itself as an extension or subsidiary of the Jewish religion instead of stressing its truly opposing character. As a result of this error, a Jewish mentality of intolerance, accompanied by a spirit of hatred, became established in the civilized Christian world and generation after generation grew up imbued with the materialistic and unimaginative teachings of the Old Testament. English Protestantism became especially subjected to the influence of the Old Testament. The mentality of the English merchant princes and the spiritual attitude of the Puritans likewise became identified with the principles of the Jewish Old Testament and found in it the justification of a certain business conduct. In the 19th century, some deluded English scholars even tried to prove that the inhabitants of Britain were actually descendants of the lost Tenth Tribe of Israel. Werner Sombart, the famous authority on capitalism, showed conclusively that the roots of capitalism are as much Jewish as Protestant. One thing, however, can be stated as certain. With the advent of Protestantism, the former unity of the Christian world was broken up. Christ's Church separated into Catholicism and Protestantism. Through this breach, Mosaic nationalism boldly penetrated the Christian world and Christian spiritual life. Under the pretext of enlightenment and progress, the inhabitants of the ghettos began to shout loudly for emancipation, the very thing which, even Voltaire, the greatest champion of progress, had regarded as a mortal peril. Under the guise of philanthropy and enlightenment, Christianity itself strove for Jewish emancipation. It appeared unable to see that this might mean one day the death of Christianity, of Catholicism, of Protestantism, or Orthodoxy and of Unorthodoxy alike. The despised Middle Ages were well aware that this possibility was always present because of the fanatical force of Jewish religious Nazism directed against Christianity, the source of most of which is to be found in Talmud. In 1888, the Minerva Press published a striking account, which was never refuted about the findings of an investigating committee called together in 1240 by St. Louis the King of France. The king wanted to know why the Jews were so hated in France. He convened a royal court over which he presided. Talmud was presented and expounded to the court by a Christianized Jew who spoke Hebrew well. To test the authenticity of the Talmudic text the court invited Jechiel, the rabbi of Paris, together with rabbis Judah Samuel and Jacob, the latter being an eminent orator well known in both France and Spain. The fair-minded king did his utmost to ensure that the rabbi should have every chance to defend Talmud as well as to confirm the genuineness of the Talmudic text. 
Despite all this, the court was forced to conclude that the Talmudic laws are contrary and even repugnant to the social order, not only of all Christian but even of all non-Jewish communities. As a result of inquiries, the court discovered that Talmud not only repeatedly insults the Virgin Mary but casts doubts that Christ was born from a virgin, and even states that he was the child of a soldier named Pandara and a woman of the streets. The Christians were appalled when these translations of Talmud were pronounced to be authentic by the invited rabbis. As a result of the final conclusions of this court of inquiry, St. Louis ordered that Talmud be committed to the flames. The Hidden Empire, 1945, page 27. In later times, the Christian world paid little attention to the Jews' holy book though, for them, it had become nearly as important as Torah. It was from Talmud that hatred emanated towards Christians and from it also spread a double morality. It is worthwhile to note that even as late as the 20th century there is no authentic translation of Talmud available. It is true that it has been translated by Greets, a university professor of German-Jewish descent, but all the incriminating parts have been excluded. The Hungarian author Alphonse Luzinski has also translated certain parts of the Talmud. One of the principal concerns of the present Bolshevik dictatorship was to throw Alphonse Luzinski into jail where he has most probably perished in a Jewish communist torture chamber. But Talmud continued to foster that Jewish nationalism which lived ever more vividly in the dreams of Maimonides and of the Jewish prophets of the Middle Ages as well as in the heart of Jewry. Well before the outbreak of the French Revolution, the Jewish people were active and on the move towards the realization of the Mosaic Covenant. The breach affected in Christian unity, together with so-called enlightenment and social progress, were all favorable to this purpose, the capture of world power. And now the plan was roughly sketched out we will examine it more closely later under the denomination of biological class warfare or the physical destruction and extermination of the non-Jewish nations, i.e. the event known as revolution. After the First World War, the cultured Western world was shocked by a series of articles in the London Morning Post entitled Underground Conspirators. H. Aguin, the editor of this paper, in his book, The Cause of World Unrest, quoting authoritative contemporary reference books until then ignored by liberal historians, points out that the French Revolution was far from having been entirely caused by a revolutionary disposition of the lower classes. At this time both Jewish and Masonic powers were already operating, and by buying up all grain stocks, they created an artificial famine and through this famine the revolution of July 14. As early as 1776, the Spartacus movement, created by Adam Weishaupt, had been established in Bavaria and this movement suddenly reappeared again in many different guises inciting dangerous outbursts during the various revolutions after the First World War. Gwynne's treatise proves that all the revolutionary movements of the 19th century were infiltrated and to a great extent controlled by Jewry. Gwynne established Jewry's role in Freemasonry with the help of data contained in the Book of the Converted Jew, Abbot Lemon, L'Entrée des Israelites dans la Société Francaise, as well as with the evidence collected by the American author and Freemason Albert Pike. He proved that Jewry had inculcated a hatred of Christianity into the secret societies, so that under the cover of liberalism they were actually able to remain undisturbed while they worked to undermine the Christian social order. Thus the Jewish Nazism of the Old Testament, besides its money power, acquired a new and terrible weapon for the destruction of Christian people. The name of this new weapon was Revolution. The International Socialist Organization began in 1864 with the foundation of the First Internationale, and both its leaders Marx and La Salle were Jews. Both of them were prophets of hatred, seeking revenge for the humiliation of their race. Disraeli in his book, Koningsby, predicts a German workers' movement under Jewish direction and leadership. With all this, a new factor appeared in the history of European culture, 
organized hatred and envy as a systematically engineered force to create classes and societies as well as to destroy them. The intolerance prevalent in Europe was rooted in the spirit of the Old Testament, but even more reeking of the Old Testament and more Talmudic was this engineered hatred. The prophets of which preached exactly the same slogans and promises as the Old Testament when it promised the chosen people that Jehovah would pour out before them all the riches and wealth of the world and that they would only need to work two or three hours a day for their living. The Nazism of the Old Testament found a formidable ally in the European working classes and later in the American proletariat, which had every right to become embittered and hostile to the exploiting capitalistic system. But the proletariat was slow to realize that the originators, operators, and beneficiaries of this capitalism were at the same time the representatives of both Jewish nationalism and of the Internationale. There is no doubt that the seeds of the diabolical Jewish plans were well embodied in Marx's teaching. They aimed to destroy the intellectual elite, the aristocracy, the middle classes, the clergy and white-collar workers of all non-Jewish nations by the use of the false doctrine of equality and by arousing the envy of the proletarian masses. They plotted to deprive the nations of their leaders and to degrade humanity to a leaderless and cattle-like herd. This was no longer socialist planning. This was Jewry's own global strategy. Each leaderless man in the herd becomes the blind tool and slave of that Jewish tribal Nazism bent on conquering the world. Though Marx had, in fact, championed internationalism, Jewry was never international. It wanted to internationalize the proletariat only. To the proletariat was assigned the role to destroy their respective countries together with their religions, so that the international world state could be established possessing one elite, one ruling class, the Jews exclusively. Jews were to be found in every nation. They spoke the language of their adopted country yet remained Jews, proud and conscious representatives of an exclusive racial conception, of a supranational Nazism. The shattered forces of Christ's rebellion took shelter from the noisy slogans of enlightenment in the cool naves of the churches. The Christian faith had been gradually stripped of its innate spiritual inspiration and influence and now became transformed into Jewish Christianity. It clung and adhered in a materialistic way to its worldly influence and to its worldly wealth, instead of following its calling and realizing that the time was ripe to preach Christ's teaching with unflagging vigor. At the same time, Jewry, having preserved its religious and racial unity, was now able to penetrate the enfeebled Christian communities with great effect. While the flame of Jewish nationalism was burning ever brighter, the Christian rebellion was losing its faith and becoming timid, skeptical and impotent. The religious nationalism of the Old Testament was able to imbue the inhabitants of the Russian ghettos with faith and racial consciousness. But the Christianity of the New Testament became so faint-hearted that it began to be ashamed of the New Testament as well as of its own creed, which it sometimes suspected might be out of date or unscientific when compared with the slogans of what was known as Enlightenment. When faced with the great social problems of the age Christianity proved to be inert and impotent. But at the same time, Jewry was able to furnish its own race with faith. Not faith in God, since many Jews were apparently relinquishing their creed, but faith in a fanatical political nationalism. On the other hand, the Christian revolution failed to complete its mission on earth, i.e. to support the humble against their persecutors and so achieve social justice through love and not through hatred. By the 19th century, Christianity had already become more a formality than a living creed. It could not hope to match the modern conception of Christ's revolution against the idea of the Marxist revolution. The papal encyclicals, Rerum Novarum and Quadragesima Anno were only theoretical interpretations of the attitude adopted by socialism and by the liberal state system. Christ's church militant did not fight as ardently as it should have done. 
it conveniently resigned to falling back on Christ's well-known maxim, my kingdom is not of this world, whereas Marxism stressed the conception of a physical salvation on this earth. This latter idea, of course, was entirely of Jewish origin. Jehovah himself, as well as Ezra and Nehemiah, those extollers of racial purity, had surely promised this very thing, i.e. redemption on this earth, the wealth of the world through the gates of Jerusalem, the 18 hours working week and welfare state. The Marxist promise was also redemption on earth, but behind the screen of promises stood Jewish nationalism, because the Marxist leaders knew that the achievement of what they called redemption meant also the establishment of the Jewish world kingdom. Christianity was unable to unite and so to follow up the social conception of Christ's revolution. On the other hand, Jewry remained undivided in the racial and spiritual unity of its 4,000-year-old Nazism. After the French Revolution, the secret societies, as well as certain governments themselves dominated by Jewish influence, gradually expelled Christianity from public life until its role became merely to encourage attendance at the churches. With Christianity so weak and divided, what power could have successfully opposed these pressures? The Greek Orthodox Church with its empty formalism, or Roman Catholicism with its bishop sitting complacently in the possession of several hundred thousand acres of church lands, latifundia, and preaching poverty and justice to the masses, or Protestantism which became more and more saturated with the spirit of the Old Testament? In the circumstances, could any power exist capable of influencing the masses and of bringing them over to the side of the Christian revolution? Christianity began to retain a life apart, refraining from criticizing public events, from influencing public opinion or from putting into practice socialist concepts. These roles were taken over by the press, which was in the hands of Jewish, nationalism, by members of the Masonic lodges or by the Marxist agitator. Faced with this Marxist heaven on earth, Christianity was unable to vindicate the social meaning of Christ's teaching. Furthermore, it abandoned its leadership and did not stand up for the masses. With the withdrawal of Christianity from public life, there arose in its place a fanatical determination to destroy all the institutions of the Gentiles, both human and divine. Its aim was to deprive them of their leaders and thus establish the final rule of Jewry's world government. As early as the turn of the 19th century, that great thinker Houston Stuart Chamberlain warned the Christian world as follows. The problem of the Jews living amongst us is belonging to the most difficult and most fateful questions of the present time. H. S. Chamberlain, in his work, Foundations of the Nineteenth Century, Volume 1, page 163. At the beginning of the twentieth century all doubts concerning the success of the Great Plan could be put to rest. The leaders of world Jewry had only one thing more to decide, i.e., the actual means to be employed in securing world power. Was this to be achieved through gold or through the Tommy gun? Through plutocracy or through communist terror directed by the Jewish bosses of the secret police? Should the new synagogue be the seat of the money changers and scribes or of the terrorist Sadducees? Or should it perhaps be open to both factions working side by side? To this great dilemma, a certain document, pronounced by the Jews to be a forgery, gives a clear answer. Chapter 3 World Domination in Three Stages Jewry did its utmost to disprove the authenticity of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Today, any person who dares to make even the slightest reference to the protocols is labeled an uncivilized barbarian by the Jews. On June 26, 1933, the Federation of Jewish Communities of Switzerland and the Bern Jewish Community brought an action against five members of the Swiss National Front, seeking a judgment that the protocols were a forgery and a prohibition of their publication. The procedure of the court was astounding, the provisions of the Swiss Civil Code being deliberately set aside. Sixteen witnesses called by the plaintiffs were heard, but only one of the forty witnesses called by the defendants was allowed a hearing. 
The judge allowed the plaintiffs to appoint two private stenographers to keep the register of proceedings during the hearing of their witnesses, instead of entrusting the task to a court official. In view of these and similar irregularities, it was not surprising that, after the case had lasted just on two years, the court pronounced the protocols to be a forgery and demoralizing literature. The decision was given on May 14, 1935, but it was announced in the Jewish press before it was delivered by the court. On November 1, 1937, the Swiss Court of Criminal Appeal quashed this judgment in its entirety. Jewish propagandists, however, still declare that the protocols have been proved to be a forgery. It is clear, however, that the original text of the Protocols of Zion was in the hands of the Jews of Odessa as early as 1890. The protocols were published in 1905 by the Russian Milus. According to certain versions, their author was the Oriental Asher Ginsberg under the pen name of Akkad Ham, meaning from the same people, and his purpose was to try to arouse the Jewish national consciousness. A copy of this book published by Nilus was acquired by the British Museum in 1906, where it can be found catalogued today. While worldwide controversy regarding the authenticity of the protocols continued, their genuineness was established by a higher authority than any court, world history itself. The Jewish program outlined in 1906 has since been literally and realistically carried out. We may, therefore, consider the protocols from various angles, either as the world plan drawn up by the elders of Zion of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, as the secret records of the Zionist Congress of Baal, or simply as a pamphlet written by an extreme Jewish nationalist, all this is irrelevant. The only relevant and indisputable fact is that the program has nearly been accomplished in its entirety. Even more has been accomplished than was foreseen by the elders of Zion. The world conquerors have subdued the world. Instead of pursuing in detail the purposeless controversies disputing the authenticity of the protocols, we want to prove one thing only, i.e., that the elders of Zion have materialized their program. There now remains but a single step for Jewry to take before announcing openly that world power is in their grasp. For the time being Jewry appears to be a bit obscured behind the political, economic and spiritual powers ruling mankind, but it is ready to spring into action at any moment. It is preparing to complete that single step, after which the sixth point will be added to the five-pointed star as well as to the white American pentacle, which will thus become the open symbol of the accomplished world kingdom, i.e. the six-pointed David star. There remains another question in connection with the protocols, and that is, did there ever exist any open or secret Jewish organization to lay down plans for a world program? Did a secret Jewish government exist to direct world Jewry according to the teaching of Torah and of Talmud or, perhaps, of the protocols? There is no doubt that inside the Jewish community, as early as before the birth of Christ, an organization, known as the Kahal or Kahila, was existent and acting as the political executive body of the theocratic Jewish state. We can therefore presume that the Jewish nation in its exile preserved something from this organization. We pointed out earlier that even before the dispersion both the Alexandrian and Roman diaspora had acquired real governmental and political powers. After the dispersal, each Jewish community possessed its own miniature kahila, the purpose of which was to arbitrate in legal disputes between Jews, especially in cases where it was undesirable to submit the matter to the Christian courts and thus expose it to publicity. In countries densely overrun by Jews, the existence of these kahilas was well known by everybody. But doubtless there must have been a higher Jewish administrative body as well, what we might perhaps call nowadays an emigrational committee which kept the Jews together and coordinated their political ambitions. There are documentary proofs that this supreme Jewish kahal kept constantly appearing under different names throughout history. Once it was to be found in Constantinople under the name of the Sanhedrin, and a great satrap was the head of Jewry. 
later on, it was seen in various movements, in French Freemasonry as well as among the supreme commands of the great powers in the First World War. Traces can be found everywhere of the activities of this secret world government. In 1920, returning from the unsuccessful peace conference of Versailles, President Wilson of the United States announced openly. There was a secret force at work in Europe which we were unable to trace. Disraeli, in 1844, in his book Koningsby, frankly states that. The world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. In the Wiener Frey Presse on December 24, 1921, the Jewish Walter Rathenau wrote precisely the same thing when he said, 300 men, each of whom knows all the others, govern the fate of the European continent, and they elect their successors from their entourage. The functions of the Kahila, Kahal, are well known in New York, because the Jews often give Kahila parties. Very interesting exposures about all this are contained in the book, The Hidden Empire, 1946, in which, on page 35, we find. The Jews of the world divide the earth into two hemispheres, the eastern and the western. As the United States lies in the western hemisphere, we will confine ourselves to that alone. The Kahal is understood to be constructed in the symbol of seven. The sponsor for the Eastern Hemisphere is not for consequence herein, however, both sponsors for both hemispheres are alleged to be accountable only to, aka Dam, the unknown and uncrowned king of Jewry throughout the earth, whose identity is kept guarded secret. It is indisputable, therefore, that some kind of central Jewish organization or government existed all the time, which methodically carried out the world program of the elders of Zion. But whether such a government existed or not, the fact must be emphasized that the program itself was accomplished and this in itself presents sufficient proof of its organization. The fact must be stressed that world Jewry has already completed the second stage planned by the elders of Zion and everything is fully prepared to complete the rest soon, and thus to reach the third and final stage. Fifty years ago, or during the legal proceedings at Bern, the authenticity of the protocols might have been disputed. But the execution of the program of the protocols with its ardent Old Testament nationalism was forever in evidence. The existence of the protocols was perhaps disputable but not that of its nationalism. In the protocols, which are most probably extracts only from the real program, appear the methods by which Jewry is to accomplish world domination. From the somewhat mysterious text, the cursory reader will gather that the protocols sometimes talk about dictatorship, sometimes about liberalism and that they plan to achieve world power sometimes through capitalism and by the power of the press and sometimes by the practice of what are unmistakably Bolshevik methods. When the protocols of Zion were in the hands of the Jews of Odessa, the teaching of Lenin was unknown. Nevertheless, in the protocols, the complete ideology of Lenin, together with the fighting tactics employed by the ruling minority, are found. The reader may be surprised to learn that, after all, capitalism is the political method preferred by the Jews in order to obtain final domination over the world. After a critical study of the protocols, we realize with surprise that the difference between Bolshevism and capitalism is illusory. The elders of Zion were clearly aware that Bolshevism is nothing else but the end product of liberal capitalism, i.e. both are two different forms of the same totalitarian rule, and the ideology of both essentially consists of the elements contained in materialism, minority rule, the lavish use of the checkbook and the terrorism of the Tommy gun. A reappraisal of historical events will provide us with a solution to the obscure parts of the protocols. The elders of Zion planned three stages in the establishment of the throne of King Solomon. The first stage was to secure for Jewry control over money and capitalism, to establish Jewry's exclusive control over the press and to increase its influence, while at the same time destroying and compromising the elite of non-Jewish society. 
simultaneously to use the ideal of liberalism as a battering ram for the destruction of the Gentile nations, to bring about the perversion of Roman law as well as of all other legal systems, to arouse envy and discontent among the working classes, and to perpetuate hatred between societies and states. The first stage also included the spreading of dissension between Christian states, the unleashing of wars and the starting of revolutions, but all these activities were still to be pursued within the framework of liberalism. We must be in a position to respond to every act of opposition by war with the neighbors of that country which dares to oppose us, but if these neighbors should also venture to stand collectively together against us, then we must offer resistance by a universal war. For the first stage fighters, the protocols prescribe intrusion into the Christian family, a ceaseless struggle against religion, the monopolization of the press, the provoking of the workers to revolution and the slow destruction of Christian societies. In the first place all kingdoms must be suppressed, after which the aristocracy must be destroyed, the landed classes pauperized and the spirit of revolution awakened in the masses. On the ruins of the natural and genealogical aristocracy of the Goyim, we have set up the aristocracy of our educated class headed by the aristocracy of money. The qualifications for this aristocracy we have established in wealth, which is dependent upon us, and in knowledge, for which our learned elders provide the motive force. Protocol 1. The last sentence of the protocol makes us think of the role now being played by Jews in the Atomic Energy Commission. The authors of the protocols clearly see that in the age of liberal capitalism free competition is the surest way towards the second stage. We will appear as alleged saviors of the worker from oppression, the protocols continue, as when we invite him to enter the ranks of our fighting forces, socialists, anarchists, communists, to whom we always give support in accordance with an alleged brotherly rule of our social masonry. Protocol 3. We must not forget that these protocols first came to light as long ago as 1906, and has not this program been fully carried out since? During the first stage, both the tactics as well as the weapons employed are different. Our countersign is, force and make-believe, preach these Pharisees in the protocols, adding at the same time, only force conquers in political affairs, especially if it be concealed in the talents essential to statesmen. Protocol 1. The authors of the protocols were inflicted with no ideological inhibitions. They foresaw clearly all that has since been accomplished, namely, that the exploitation of finance capitalism would prepare the way for Bolshevism. The people, blindly believing things in print, cherishes, thanks to promptings intended to mislead and to its ignorance, a blind hatred towards all conditions which it considers above itself, for it has no understanding of the meaning of class and condition. This hatred will be further magnified by the effects of an economic crisis, which will stop dealings on the exchanges and bring industry to a standstill. We shall create by all the secret subterranean methods open to us and with the aid of gold, which is all in our hands, a universal economic crisis whereby we shall throw upon the streets whole mobs of workers simultaneously in all the countries of Europe. These mobs will rush delightedly to shed the blood of those whom, in the simplicity of their ignorance, they have envied from their cradles, and whose property they will then be able to loot. Ours they will not touch, because the moment of attack will be known to us and we shall take measures to protect our own. Protocol 3. It is enough to recall the last 30 or 40 years of European and world history to conclude that this is indeed the beginning of the second stage for this is Bolshevism itself. The single rebel, the proletarian masses filled with hatred and envy, led by the same commissars and agitators who at present control the banking systems, the parliaments and press of the capitalist states. They are all, of course, offspring of the same tribal alliance. They are all representatives of the same double-faced nationalism. 
The real hidden face of Talmud shows up here, the distorted features of the bloodthirsty Sadducee, scheming to destroy all other nations, even by massacre if necessary, he who led the great Christian pogroms of 1945 with as much zeal as the braves of Bar Kochba in 131a.d, during the great Jewish revolt in the Mediterranean. Protocol 3 goes on. The aristocracy which enjoyed by law the labor of the workers was interested in seeing that the workers were well-fed, healthy, and strong. We are interested in just the opposite, in the diminution, the killing out of the goyim. Our power is in the chronic shortness of food and physical weakness of the worker because by all that this implies he is made the slave of our will and he will not find in his own authorities either strength or energy to set against our will. What else is this if not a nightmarish vision of Bolshevism? Three decades before its outbreak. What else but the program of the former Illuminati with its Jewish characteristics, hunger and persuasion? This is nothing less than a vivid description of the Russia of Stalin Kaganovich itself, in which, according to the protocols, is to be found the secret police and an institution called the People's Court enforcing absolute suppression and complete exploitation of the workers. Already we are in the second stage. In Russia, the Kalkas slave has to kneel down before the commissar. In the Soviet, the Jewish foreman or factory director has authority to withdraw ration cards from those workers who are unable to fulfill the prescribed norm, i.e. the ordered amount of forced labor. The six million persons starved to death in the Ukrainian famine, the sacrificed Hungarian, German, Romanian and Italian prisoners of war who died of hunger, caused by the withdrawal of their ration cards, prove that this part of the program is fulfilled wherever Israel is king. But the writers of the protocols saw clearly that this was not enough. That Bolshevism is only the means of breaking, degenerating and bestializing the masses and so reducing them to a human herd. That capitalism and Bolshevism together with the class struggle are implements only. All these are not yet sufficient to attain absolute security and an impregnable position for Jewry. Remember the French Revolution, to which it was we who gave the name of great, the secrets of its preparation are well known to us, for it was wholly the work of our hands. Ever since that time we have been leading the peoples from one disenchantment to another, so that in the end they should turn also from us in favor of that king despot of the blood of Zion, whom we are preparing for the world. Protocol 3. This is the third stage. The last and the most important. The authors of the protocols tell us that when this is reached, at the last minute, Jewry will annul with a single stroke of the pen, every principle it had professed to the goyim. Liberalism and socialism will be succeeded by a complete and absolute despotism. By an outwardly patriarchal Jewish world kingdom, but one which is essentially cruel and terroristic, ruled exclusively by Jews. Protocol 3 explains that it is absolutely necessary for the people to see the incarnation of power and authority in the person of their ruler. He is the God-chosen monarch whose mission is to crush those destructive forces whose origin is neither in the intellect nor in the human spirit but in the animal-like instincts of mankind. Today these forces are uppermost and they will assume various forms of violence and robbery perpetrated in the name of law and order. They will disrupt the present social system in order to establish the throne of the King of Israel. But as soon as his power is achieved, the role of these forces will be over. Then it will be necessary to sweep them away from its path, on which must be left no knot, no splinter. Later we will see how prophecies which in 1890 or 1906 appeared to be far from fulfillment became reality, they were fulfilled with astonishing accuracy. In the West at the turn of the century stormtroops of the world conquerors, consisting of the bourgeois, capitalist and middle-class Jewish social strata stood by ready for action, led by the assimilated intellectual Jewish progressive elite, i.e. by writers and journalists, etc. For the Western Jew was also a pupil of Talmud. Meanwhile, in the East, 
more than 5 million members of Jewry scattered over the area between the Volga and Danube, the masses of both Russian and East Polish Jewry were still dreaming dreams of the Jewish world kingdom, bending over their Talmuds and Torahs in the synagogues of Bels, Brestlitovsk and Mir Marasajit. Lehos Feher, the Budapest-born Jewish scholar, spoke no more than the truth when he pointed out in his great work entitled Jewry that Talmud had, in fact, reduced Jewry to a ritual slavery. The strict and detailed ritual rules prescribe some kind of religious duty at all hours of the day. Rubens in his work, Der Alte Uindi der Neue Glob, or, The Old and the New Faith, comes to the conclusion that a Jew has to spend half of each day carrying out ritual. There are some 3,000 religious ceremonies prescribed by Talmud to commemorate the death of Moses alone. All these made it impossible for an Orthodox Jew to undertake any productive occupation. In such circumstances, he was unable to do the 14 hours daily work of a Polish, Russian or Hungarian peasant but not being connected with the peasantry had its advantages. It was easy for Jewry in a comparatively short time to transform itself into a middle class and to take its place among the intellectual social stratum. As it was not tied to the land, it was free to engage wholly in intellectual activities such as in the reading of the holy books. If we examine the significance of this during the last 2,000 years, we understand better, why this race has produced so many intellectuals, writers, poets, journalists, politicians, and atom scientists. Thus, Jewry increased fast in stature. It needed only to learn the language of a country to be able to become part of the middle class, bourgeoisie or moneyed aristocracy of that country. It was able to occupy more key positions than any other nation, which naturally included working classes and peasantry as well. From this, it was only a step to develop a more grandiose messianic conception. Why should not this race of 15 million people form the ruling classes of every nation on earth by assuming an external English veneer, a Russian manner, an American boisterousness, or French politeness, all the time remaining imbued with the same uniform consciousness of Jewish nationalism? Purim is the only day of national rejoicing when Jewry may get drunk to commemorate the killing of the first anti-Semite, Haman, together with his ten sons, and of the slaying of 75,000 Gentiles in the city of Shushan and the provinces. Jan and Jerem Therod in their pro-Jewish book In the Shadow of the Crucifix are at pains to point out that the Jewish nation never knew the meaning of the word love. Although the saying love thy neighbor as thyself was a Mosaic commandment, nevertheless, this was restricted to the members of the Jewish tribes, and even further to the next of kin. Meanwhile, Eastern Jewry evolved into a community forming a kind of reservoir of hatred and animosity, which was directed towards all those around them. The Western Jews, the staunch Marxists, expected at first that the proletarian revolution, as prophesied by Marx, would materialize somewhere in the West. And in the meanwhile, in the West, indeed, more exactly, in Brussels, half a century ago, Almost in romantic circumstances, the Russian Bolshevik party was founded. Among the founders, we see a former member of the Russian lesser nobility, an expelled seminarist from Georgia, the daughter of a Russian captain of industry and a progressive journalist. With the exception of one or two, they were all Jews. One and a half decades later, Holy Russia was ground to the dust by Jewish nationalism, which here started directly from the second stage to carry out the plans of the elders of Zion for the establishment of the Jewish world kingdom. Chapter 4 Millionaire Bankers Back Bolsheviks Before the First World War, a certain picture postcard was freely sold in the Jewish shops of Russia, Lithuania, and Poland. On this postcard a rabbi was shown holding Torah in one hand and in the other Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia, cartooned as a white pullet chicken, with the Romanov crown on its head. Under the picture, the following text appeared in Hebrew, Sa Khalifati Sadam Urati, 
Sakaparati. This means, the sacrificial animal shall be my absolution, it will be my substitute and expiatory offering. The Hebrew text is actually part of the prayer, called Kapara. The rituals relating to this sacrifice are contained in Leviticus, chapter 16, 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. Some rabbis opposed this doctrine. But wherever Kabbalists were living among Eastern Jewry, on the Day of Atonement, a white cockerel rooster and a white pullet chicken were usually sacrificed in lieu of the goat. This postcard was thus an open invitation by Jewry to murder the Tsar. Hatred against Tsarism was already latent in consequence of the pogroms, but it was kept at boiling point by the Mosaic commandment, Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, as king, which is not thy brother. When Bolshevism broke out the Tsar and his family was murdered in Ekaterinburg, the Tsar's murderers were Yakov, or Jacob, Swerdlov, who became later the president of the Soviet Union. Lead executioner, Yakov, or Jacob, Yurovsky, Kahim Galoxikin, and Peter Jernikov. All Jews. But all those who schemed for fifty years to bring about the disintegration and subjugation of Russia were Jews also. Fifty percent of the members of the first Social Democratic Party of Russia, from which the Bolshevik Party was later formed, were Jews. The Polish Social Democratic Party was at first organized as the Jewish Democratic Party, and the situation was similar in Lithuania. Kerensky himself, who became the Prime Minister of the First Republic, was a Jew by birth. The greatest Russian novelist, Dostoevsky, whose treatise about the Jews is, even today, kept carefully hidden away by the so-called Western, free, publishing houses, saw as early as 1887 that the scourge of Judah was poised over the head of the Russian people and that the red shadow of Bolshevism would descend over holy Russia. Their kingdom and their tyranny is coming, he wrote. The unlimited despotism of their ideology is now only beginning. Under this tyranny human kindness and neighborliness as well as the longing for justice will fade away, all Christian and patriotic ideals will perish forever. Bolshevism won. And in the moment of its victory, the Jewish intellectuals, the young revolutionaries as well as those poverty-stricken Jews at the bottom of the capitalistic ladder, turned their faces towards Russia. Whether Bolsheviks or not, they were, nevertheless, as Jews, becoming aware that those succeeding the Tsarist regime were almost all Jews, too. A member of Hungarian middle-class Jewry, Laszlo Lakatos Kellner, had greeted Lenin in a poem by writing. The new Christ has arrived. Lenin. Lenin. The official gazette of Hungarian Jewry, the Giant Loseg, or Equality, read mostly by well-to-do citizens, published the following in an article praising Trotsky Bronstein. Jewish intellect and knowledge, Jewish courage and love of peace saved Russia, and perhaps the whole world. Never has world historical mission of Jewry shone so brightly as in Russia. Trotsky's words prove that the biblical and prophetic Jewish spirit of Isaiah and Micah, the great peacemakers, with that of the Talmudic elders, is inspiring the leaders of Russia today. The American banker, Jacob Schiff, head of the Kuhn Low Banking House, and Jewish American financiers supported the Bolsheviks from the very beginning with huge loans and innumerable large donations. These bankers knew the leaders of Russia just as well as they knew the prophecy of Amschkel Mayer, the founder of the House of Rothschild. Over the Rothschild House in Frankfurt a red flag was displayed on a shield. Jean Drault, the French writer, remembered old Amschkel Mayer saying to customers in his shop, One day this flag will rule the world. Karl Marx, grandson of the rabbi of Trier, must have known this flag very well too. He, 
as well as anybody, was well aware that Jewish capitalism and Jewish Marxism are but two different forms of the same Judaism, of that same world-conquering nationalism. Rothschild's red flag is just as cheerful and bracing a sight for Morgenthau as it is for Kaganovich. While it is interesting to learn that Bolshevism adopted its red flag from a Jewish banker, it is also noteworthy that the Bolshevik revolutionary greeting, i.e. the raised clenched fist, is a symbol of Jewish origin too. The paper entitled The Key to the Mystery, on page 21 of the number dated August 7, 1939, describes how, on the Feast of Purim, held in commemoration of the slaying of 75,000 Gentiles, the Jews still greet each other with a raised clenched fist. But the Christian world still asks how could collusion be possible between two deadly enemies like capitalism and Bolshevism? This question was definitively answered in 1918 by the report of the United Secret Service, Second Army Bureau, naming the persons who financed the Bolshevik Revolution in 1916. Under Jewish pressure, this report was destroyed by the State Department, but it was too late, then. The Rev. Dennis Fahey, professor of theology, in his book, The Mystical Body of Christ in the Modern World, and Monsignor Jewin, in his work, Luperal judeo Macanique or The Judeo-Masonic Peril, both quote the complete report. We here briefly refer to it, but the full text is available. According to the American Counterintelligence and News Service, the following big American bankers gave money to Lenin and his comrades for the Bolshevik Revolution, Jacob Schiff, Guggenheim, Max Breitung, the banking house of Kuhn Loeb and Company, the directors of which were at that time Jacob Schiff, Felix Warburg, Otto Kahn, Mortimer Schiff, and S. H. Hanauer. As the report remarks, all Jews. The report quotes articles in the Daily Forward, the Bolshevik Jewish paper of New York, describing in detail how large sums of money in dollars were transferred to the Bolsheviks from the assets of the Westphalian Rhineland Syndicate, a large Jewish business concern. How the Parisian Jewish banking house of Lazar Brothers, the Gunsberg Bank of St. Petersburg, with affiliations in Tokyo and Paris, the London banking house of Spire and Company, and the Naya Banken of Stockholm, Sweden. All sent money to the Bolsheviks. The statement of the American Military Counterespionage and Intelligence Service established the fact that Jacob Schiff gave $12 million towards the financing of the Bolshevik Revolution. As for the Parisian banking house of Lazar, they not only played a considerable role in the unleashing of the Second World War, but their former director Mr. Alchel is today on the board of executives of Free Europe Incorporated, and is at present occupied with the reorganization of Europe. This peculiar ganging up, this conspiracy of Bolsheviks and bankers can only be plausibly explained by Jewish nationalism. Though the prostration of Russia, the land of pogroms, as well as the extermination of the Tsar's family, were all criminal Bolshevik perpetrations, nevertheless in the eyes of Jewish nationalism these appeared to be the acts of Jews, the triumph of Jewry, the glorious liberation struggle of religious irredentism. Absolute political power in Russia had fallen openly into the hands of Jewry. At first, perhaps, Lenin's teachings were not fully understood by the Jewish masses. Nevertheless, they saw that nearly all the leaders and rulers of the new Russian state system were descendants of Abraham. Lenin himself was Yulianov formally only. His father was a member of the Russian lesser nobility. But his mother was the daughter of a German Jew doctor called Israel Blank, later changing his name to Alexander Blank, after pretending to convert to the Russian Orthodox faith for advantageous purposes only. Lenin inherited his Jewish mania for destruction and his desperate lust for power from his mother, both characteristics being equally Judaistic. Victor Marsden, the English journalist who was engaged as a correspondent during the First World War in Russia, describes Lenin as follows. Quote, Lenin, a comic Jew, married to a Jewess, whose children spoke Yiddish. 
Herbert Fritch, a Scotland Yard detective, who, in the guise of a valet, penetrated the entourage of Lennon and reported him to be a typical Jew. The Morning Post at the same time published a list of the names, pseudonyms, and racial origin of the founders of the secret government, together with its 50 most important key functionaries. They were about 98% Jewish. The London Jewish Chronicle of April 4, 1919, boldly states, The conceptions of Bolshevism are in harmony in most points with the ideas of Judaism. Victor Marsden, the Morning Post reporter in Russia, states that among the 545 leading Bolshevik officials, there were 477 Jews at the birth of Bolshevism. But the point of view of Jewish nationalism was appreciably different. The Jews paid scant attention to the exterminated bishops, to the slain priests, and to the starved or massacred Russian masses in their hundreds of thousands. They appreciated the Jewish success only. The gruesome events in Russia surpass all imagination. Statistics compiled from the early days of Bolshevism and quoted also in the American congressional records confirm that during the first years 28 bishops and archbishops. 150,000 police officers, 6,776 priests, 48,000 gendarmes, 6,765 teachers, 355,000 intellectuals, 8,500 doctors, 198,000 workers, 54,000 army officers, 915,000 peasants. 260,000 soldiers were murdered together with the emperor and his family. After considering these gruesome statistics, one might expect that Jewry, which has been advertised in the Jewish-dominated press all over the world as a humanitarian people, would expel these Bolshevik Jews from its ranks with loathing and contempt. But world Jewry and its great organizations at the best remain silent. And in the meanwhile, there is probably not a single country in the whole world where the Communist Party is not under the exclusive direction of Jews. In Argentina, as early as 1918, Solomon Hazelman and his wife Julia Fitz began to organize communism. The Argentine Revolution broke out in January 1919, and its victims in Buenos Aires alone included 800 dead and 4,000 injured. The leader of the revolt was Pedro Wald, alias Nailskovskij, and its minister of war was Makaro Zayazin, both Eastern Jews. After the suppression of the revolt, other movements were organized by Jews. There were many Jews and communists amongst the teachers and university professors. Siskin A. Sandberg initiated Bolshevik education of the Argentine youth. Among Yiddish newspapers, Reuter Stern, Reuter Hilf, Der Poer and Schivolt were all engaged in spreading dangerous Bolshevik propaganda. The Chilean Bolshevik Uprising of 1931 and the Uruguayan Bolshevik Rebellion of 1932 were engineered and led by the descendants of the Seed of Abraham almost exclusively. When the short-lived Brazilian Revolution was suppressed in 1935, it came to light that the actual leaders were all Jews, with the exception of a nominal leader called Luis Carlos Perestis. The Bracker, an Eastern Jewish association, organized the dock workers, and the leader of this revolt known as Ewart was, in fact, called Harry Bergner. This uprising was directed from the Soviet embassy of Montevideo by a Jewish leather merchant called Minikin. Amongst the leaders of this Brazilian uprising there were many members of the Organizaco Revolucionaria Israela de Brazer, and amongst others we mention the following names, Baruch Zell, Zaydis Janovizai, Rubens Goldberg, Moises Kava, Waldemar Roderberg, Abraheo Rosenberg, Nikolau Martinov, Yane Gandelsman, Moisey Leips, Carlos Garfunkel, Waldemar Gutinik, Enrique G. Velasqui, Jose Weiss, Armando Gusiman, Joseph Friedman, and so on. Of the South American revolutions, the Mexican one is particularly interesting, for here again a Jewish millionaire leads the Bolsheviks. 
the dictator of the Mexican Bolshevik Revolution, Plutarco Elias Calles, is the son of a Syrian Jew and an Indian woman. Calles is a Freemason of the 33rd degree and his personal fortune amounts to 80 million pesos. His friend, Aaron Saez, who played an important role as his lieutenant, and who had a fortune of 40 million pesos, is a Jew as well. In addition to his friend and secretariat, Roberto Haberman, a Romanian-born Jew, who influenced and persuaded President Calles to invite thousands of Jews fleeing Europe to come to Mexico and develop ethnic Jewish communities, while at the same time Calles was mass-executing Catholic Christians by the thousands, using his police and military to carry out these mass murders. Their persecution of the church resulted in 20,000 Catholic martyrs. Amongst these were 300 Roman Catholic priests and 200 devoted Catholic youth. But the American Bolshevik movement was the most typical and characteristic of all. In the USA, the Communist Party was set up on September 1, 1919, William Z. Foster being its first general secretary. The Daily Worker, the Communist New York Daily, began its first publication about the same time. The bulk of the followers of the American Communist Party consisted almost entirely of those Jews who had immigrated to the United States from Russia, Poland and those countries lying today behind the Iron Curtain. The USA gave them everything a great and free democracy can give, security from pogroms, prosperity, often wealth and new homes as well as decent wages. Nevertheless, at the earliest opportunity they began to plot for the overthrow of American freedom and for the total subjugation of Washington's household. The communist movement originated from the union formed by the employees of the clothing industry. Even today this union is almost entirely in Jewish hands and their first question to a prospective new member is, do you speak Yiddish? It is interesting to note that, as in Russia and Poland where the Marxist parties were organized by Jews, in America too, the Jewish organizations became the champions of communist principles. The Jewish Workers' Club, the Jewish Workers' Union, the ICOR, a company for settlers, the ARTEV, or Arbiter Theater Verbund, and the John Reed Club for Jewish Writers, were all Jewish and communistic organizations. The number of Jewish radical and communist papers, as well as Jewish periodicals edited in the USA reached 600 by 1936, and as early as 1933, the total membership of the Communist Party was estimated by Earl Browder to be about 1,200,000. In the preparatory work of organizing American Bolshevism, the National Textile Workers' Union and the Workers' International Relief played important roles. The leaders of both these great associations were Jews, Charles Steinmetz, Upton Sinclair, Helen Keller, Albert Einstein, and Bishop William M. Brown. The International Labor Defense was a very powerful organization led by millionaires or by very wealthy lawyers, despite the fact that it was typically communist. All these groups, unions, and associations hoped to capture America for Bolshevism during the Great Economic Crisis. When, in 1930, the Communists of New York tried to besiege the City Hall, the Communist papers reported with open enthusiasm. The Jewish women were fighting like tigresses. From Welt Bolshevism. Page 265. All the above-mentioned associations belonged to the non-secret or exoteric Bolshevistic formations of America. None of these open types of Bolshevistic associations presented any real peril. Surely the American worker, be he either a descendant of an early settler from the Mayflower or of an Eastern refugee, would never turn into a communist. Consequently, soon after their party was established the American Bolsheviks tried to persuade American youth to join them and serve as the hard core of the world conqueror stormtroops. They knew only too well that it would be extremely difficult to repeat in America the tricks employed in Russia. They were well aware that the American worker is neither Bolshevist nor Marxist. 
therefore, their aim was concentrated on American youth, they strove to gain the support of a deluded second generation. Therefore, well before Roosevelt came to power, they organized the Young Communist League, the National Student League, formed from the universities, and the Young Pioneers for Children between eight and nine years of age. The undermining of America, of course, was not only brought about by the communists. There also existed more peaceful cover associations and workers' unions, which, under the pretext of Marxism or socialism, really served the supranational aims of Jewish tribal nationalism. But the key positions even in those organizations, which were not directly Jewish, were captured by Jews. The CIO, the largest labor organization, was under the leadership of the Jew, Sidney Hillman, while the American Federation of Labor was founded by Samuel Gompers, an immigrant Jew from England. After all these facts, the reader will not be surprised that when Eugene Dennis was arrested on May 16, 1950, the famous Jewish writer Albert Kahan commented as follows in Jewish Life, the monthly supplement of the New York Zionist paper Freiheit. When, on May 15, Eugene Dennis, the leader of the Communist Party, was sent to prison, a shadow fell on the life of every American Jewish man and woman. Let us now have a look at Europe, omitting Russia, the old continent where chorales and psalms were composed and written, and where during the Christian Middle Ages, Jewry was confined to the ghetto. In England, the Communist Party, though of negligible strength, is directed by Jews, as are also those organizations called anti-fascist leagues or anti-war movements, where we can find such names as Lord Marley, Ivor Montague, Hannon Swaffer, Gerald Berry, Bernhard Barron, Nathan Birch, Morris Isaacs, and Harold Lasky. The noble lords, baronets and knights of Jewish descent have all suddenly taken sides with Bolshevism, which in Russia, allegedly, intends to destroy capitalism. In France, the control of Marxism is and was almost entirely in Jewish hands. Zay, Leon Blum, Dina Inns, Zyrowski, Mandelbloch and the rest are leading the same revolutionary nationalism, which ruined Holy Russia. In England, the Communist Party was represented in Parliament at one time by a Jew called Pyrotin. Those principally concerned in organizing the French Communist Party were Henri Barbousse, André Gide, Romain Roland and André Malraux. In France, the Jews enjoy the benefits of the French petty bourgeoisie, were dazzled by the powerful position of Jewry in Soviet Russia and hurried to join French communist organizations. These carried on their activities under various cover names such as the International League Against Antisemitism or the Cultural Association of Jewish Proletarians, etc. The Jewish communist organization known as Gezard can also be mentioned in this context. The Writers' International Congress held at Paris in 1935 was entirely communistic. Here it became clear from the first that the authors who were the greatest exponents of the Jewish humanitarian spirit also fervently supported the masters of Russian Bolshevism. The signboard of this congress displayed the word international, but it was in reality a great tribal gathering of nationalists dazzled by successes in Russia, the participants of which came from various lands and spoke different languages but belonged to the same race. In Belgium, a Jew called Charles Balthazar is the organizer of the Bolshevik Party, the mainstay of which is the association called the Gezard. In Sweden, similar forces are working for Bolshevism. The Swedish Communist Party was supported by one of the greatest capitalists, Ivar Kruger, the Match King, reports the paper Der Welt Bolshevism, from information received from Swedish sources. The various publishing houses and lending libraries in the hands of Jews have also greatly helped to promote Bolshevism. Neither is the situation much different in Norway where Major Quisling, in the light of experience gained in Soviet Russia, started to organize an anti-Bolshevik national party, for he realized that the same people who destroyed Russia were preparing to annihilate Norway. In Denmark, 
At this time, Jewish students as well as the Jewish professors George Brandes and David Sohn of the University of Copenhagen directed communist activities. Their main organization is the Jewish Culture Association, the IKOR, Axel Larsen, the Jewish administrative leader, confidently announced at a mass meeting that, the Danish Communist Party will not rest until it has succeeded in hanging all priests and gendarmes. In 1932, the Bolsheviks in Switzerland called themselves left-wing socialists. Leon Nicole was their leader and his assistant, a Russian Jew called Dicker, instigated the uprising of November 9, 1932, which resulted in 13 dead and 100 injured. In Austria, Austro-Marxism is at work and it would be difficult to distinguish between its democratic and communistic shades of thought, although both are inspired by Jews. Friedrich Adler was, from the outset, the chief organizer. He was the first secretary of the Second Internationale and also the murderer of Count Karl von Sturg, the Austrian ex-premier. In Romania, Anna Pokorabinovich and other Jews were the champions of Bolshevism. It was they who forced the workers into a bloody railway strike. Their influence was quite terrifying in a corrupt and liberal government like that of Romania. The paper Welt Bolshevism concludes an article as follows. It is noteworthy how strong the participation of Jewry is in the communist movement. The most dangerous activities are observed in those areas where the great masses of Jews live. Page 435. Czechoslovakia, the aircraft carrier of the Soviet Union, was completely undermined by communist organizations from the very beginning of her national independence. One of the communist leaders was Slansky Salzman. The communist literature and control of all the organizing activities are in the hands of Jews. In Bulgaria, the communist movements were headed by Jews also. When 200 officers and civilians fell victims to the plot against Sveta Nadelja, it came to light that the plot, organized by Dimitrov, was carried out by the Jews Jack and Prima Friedman. In Greece, the papers, Avanti and El Tsuino are the official organs of the Communist Party, the latter being the organ of the Communist Jewish Association in Salonika as well. And if one looks at the Far East, it is clear that here, too, the same hands are setting ablaze the fires of Bolshevism. The leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, Borodin and Krusenberg, were also of the seed of Abraham. We have deliberately left Spain to the end, as Jewish organizations can be distinctly recognized in the Spanish Civil War. When the fight broke out, the leaders, Zamora, Azara, Rosenberg and the notorious La Passionaria, whose real name was Dolores Abori, were all Jews too. And those who flooded into Spain from all sides to render more unbearable the bloody plight of the Spanish people, were all emissaries of the same racial nationalism already victorious over Russia. Ilya Ehrenborg, Bella Kuhn, Jero Erno, Zalka Mate, the leaders and members of the notorious Rokosi Roth Brigade, all belonged, almost without exception, to the emissaries of this deranged racial, Nazism. When the hour strikes, the mask falls. Christian churches and centuries-old art treasures go up in flames, drunken terrorists shoot at Christ's cross and the same, experts, again expertly crucify priests as they had done in Russia before. They scuttle prison ships with anti-revolutionaries locked up in the hold, they shoot tens of thousands of captured Christian hostages in the bullfight arena. The dead bodies of one and a half million victims and martyrs cover the battlefields of a stricken Spain. Behind all the mass misery and behind the miners of Asturias looms the same mystic power that induced the Russian sailors to revolt at Kronstadt. While the pink intellectuals begin to regard this bloodbath in the light of a passion play spectacle, progressive bankers provide it with golden arms. Old Testamental Nazism thereby paid back Ferdinand's Catholic Spain for the expulsion of the Jews, and two decades later the American Jewish Congress had the impudence to declare that, 
up to the present day Jewry has not forgiven the Spanish nation for their expulsion. It was fortunate that at that critical time there were heroic Spaniards on the spot and also European powers ready to send effective help. With the aid of the German Condor Legion and the Italian Blue Arrow Division, the Spanish people defeated these fanatics, thus proving emphatically that the Soviet Revolution could likewise have been brought under control had Russia not been deserted in her hour of need by the European powers. The massacres in Russia perpetrated by the communists had a horrifying effect on the Christian world. But these crimes appeared as heroic, attractive feats in the eyes of Jewry. In their eyes one thing mattered only, i.e. that over a vast empire, over practically one-fifth of the globe, power was seized by their nationals. During the Interventional War, the English trade unions were brought into action by a hidden hand to hinder the campaign against Bolshevism. When Poland was overrun by Bolshevism, Grand Orient Freemasonry had, with the help of Czechoslovakian Freemasons, prevented ammunition deliveries to the Poles. Eventually, Hungary's last ammunition reserves were sent to the Vistula Front and with this help, Marshal Pilsudski won the Battle of Warsaw. What interest had Western capitalist Jewry in the survival and spreading of Bolshevism? After all, the Western Jew is a capitalist, and Bolshevism proclaims the abolition of capitalism. The Western Jew consistently propagated all the various humanitarian slogans in the lodges, apparently ignoring that the whole system of Bolshevism was an outrage against humanity. The Western Jew appeared to remain faithful to his own religion while Bolshevism was proclaiming atheism. What, then, had Bolshevism in common with Western capitalism? How was it possible for Zionist organizations in New York to hail Bolshevism and for Jacob H. Schiff to give it money? Since then, history has supplied us with the answer. What Bolshevism and capitalism have in common is the ghastly fact that both of them are equally Jewish. The Western capitalist Jew saw no enemy of capitalism in the Soviet leaders, he saw only Jews. He was able to excuse the Bolsheviks' barbarities, for they were committed mostly by Jews. According to the strangest beliefs of Jewish nationalism, the Jew is a superman. Jewry is a supernation. The Jew is at liberty to act as he pleases against other races. This is the teaching of Torah and Talmud. The Jew's standing is beyond good and evil. In the beginning some Jews condemned Bolshevism for conventional reasons, but later they realized that the only thing to do was to remain silent about it, since Bolshevism, too, was led by Jews. High finance in the West was agreed on the maintenance of Jewish leadership in the Soviet Union, whatever the cost. Henry Ford's book, The International Jew, was published at this time, revealing in shocking disclosures how far the Judaization of American life had progressed. Though the Jewish boycott obliged Henry Ford to apologize for his book, he never denied the truth of its contents. After the First World War, the Jewish question in America became more and more acute. Through the monopolization of commerce and banking, the control of the turnover of public commodities, their despotic rule over the press and the poisoning of public education, the encroaching Jewish power began to threaten the American way of life. The peril was foreseen earlier by great Americans such as Benjamin Franklin, who, on one occasion, said, there is a great danger for the United States of America, this great danger, is the Jew. If they are not excluded from the United States by the Constitution, within less than 100 years they will stream into this country in such numbers they will rule and destroy us and change our form of government for which we Americans shed our blood and sacrificed life, property and personal freedom. If the Jews are not excluded, within 200 years our children will be working in the fields to feed the Jews, while they remain in the counting houses gleefully rubbing their hands. It would make an interesting bestseller to describe how certain mysterious hands spirited away his diary.
it can be stated with certainty that at the time when the Bolshevik Revolution broke out in Russia, American Jewry was already standing at the first stage of the Great Plan. During the operational attack to secure the first stage, the control over finance and the press was achieved and influence over public life firmly established. Jewish nationalism in the Western world clearly realized that, despite its ostensibly hostile ideology, Bolshevism must be kept alive, because the way to the second stage in America led by way of Bolshevism, the great Eastern ally, which would help to conquer America and to establish Jewish world power. It is understandable, therefore, that after the Russian Revolution the leaders of the 217 American Zionist organizations decided to give every possible financial help to Bolshevism. Bolshevism will be devoured by the vermin. Trotsky Bronstein exclaims in distress. But American Jewish capitalism took every care to sustain, rear and industrialize this world menace. So anti-capitalistic Bolshevism was soon supported by loans from Loeb, as well as by other long-term credits, by scientists, by contributions, and by deliveries of arms. Those giving the money were no Bolsheviks, but they were Jews. They were the representatives of a supranational racial solidarity. They gave substantial help to Bolshevism because they had the foresight to realize that if by any chance Bolshevism should collapse this would discredit the reliability of Jewish planning and leadership. Besides, this mishap would bring to light the massacres perpetrated by Jewry in the name of Bolshevism. So to prevent losing the subjected territories of Russia, regarded by now as an actually established part of the planned future Jewish world empire, Jewry gave Bolshevism every possible help. For the Christian nations, Bolshevism represented an ideology. But for Jewry, it was a Jewish national problem of superlative importance. But the firm establishment of Bolshevism in Russia was not in it itself enough. To ensure its survival and development as a power it was necessary to weaken the European Christian peoples so that they would not be able to smother the Bolshevik Hydra later on. For Jewish tribal nationalism, the period of the peace conferences following the First World War meant yet one more triumph for dreams of Jewish world domination. Wilson himself stated on his return home from the peace conference at Versailles. There was a secret force at work in Europe, which was untraceable. At the Versailles Peace Conference, the German delegation contained two Jews. Its advisors included banker Max Warburg, Dr. Von Strauss, Oskar Oppenheimer, Dr. Jaffe, Deutsch, Brentano, Strzok, Wasserman and Mendelssohn Bartholdi. All Jews. During this period, the Christian world failed to notice that the artificially deepened rifts dividing the nations, together with the injustices promoted by the peace treaties, only served to further Jewish aspirations to world power. In starving Germany, rebellious Spartacus groups together with socialist and Bolshevik revolutionaries were splitting up society. Across the Rhine, new nationalisms emerged to fly at each other's throats. In the place of the Habsburg monarchy and the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, many small opposing nationalisms prepared to pay off old scores. While the fires of the Bolshevik Revolution still smolder in Italy, the new flames of the fascist revolution begin to flare up. Meanwhile, more to the east, due to the support of Jewish finance, Bolshevism grows stronger and stronger so that the Jews of the Kremlin as well as those of the Loeb Directorate may well chant the credo of their nationalism over distracted Europe. Our men are progressing rapidly in Paris, New York and Moscow. We are advancing towards the second stage of the battle. We have divided Christian Europe and from the soil of the injustice sown by us will spring the seeds of a new war you will see that the seeds will bear fruit in the next 20 years. As the so-called Great Lenin said, the First World War gave us Russia, while a Second World War will hand Europe to us. Lenin stated this exactly two decades before World War II began. Oh, Europe, heartland of civilization, do you not yet understand?
Can you not perceive where Jewish national unity coupled with your own internal conflicts lead? Can you not see the abyss towards which you are being driven by forces imbued with the cruelty and purposefulness of a supranational people? Alas! There are so few who see it even now. An unknown friar, Silixii Verity Eula, once wrote prophecies that were soon forgotten in a book called From the Ghetto to the Throne. And herein is Nemesis. The Western Jew will equip an army of 20 million men in the East to destroy Christianity and human culture and to establish the Jewish world kingdom. End of Part 1 of World Conquerors, The Real War Criminals 1958 Chapters 1-4 through 4, By Louis Marschalko This audio video book was recorded, edited and produced on August 28, 2023, by Joey Faust and the Phoenix Party Christian Fascists. Your only salvation. In this Jewish world of darkness. Amen. If you found this video informative or useful, please consider leaving a small tip or donation of appreciation. Thank you and God bless. The End